And Dylan got as good as and better than Danny then. Brave men near death who see with blinding sight Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay Rage, rage against the dying of the light And you, my father, there on the sad height Curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Dylan's father was a, a teacher in Swansea uh, Grammar School. And then he retired and he came to Lahn and he lived in the Pelican just across the road. Very temperamental man. Mm -hmm. Not very nice. No, he... He had a terrible temper with him. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. You were ar around in, in Larm when Dylan was living here? Yeah, well, I'm only 72. <laughs> I'd say you remember him quite well. Yeah. I worked in Victoria Bakery, and uh, he used to pass there every time we used to go home to the boathouse. And oh. uh, we had quite a few chats in here, and that's all I can ever remember him drinking here were half pints of beer. Just half pints. Yeah. So he never seemed drunk to you, or kind of. Oh yeah, he, he'd have a few, right? But uh, well, he, he was one of the boys. Like, you know, he used to get involved with everybody. When my mother was interviewed in her life, when she emphasised the home life of my father over the public one, um, people were not happy at all. And I found the same when I start going on about my father's routine and how he, he never drank when he worked and that the drinking was always of a very, very temperate nature. People, first of all, don't believe me. Secondly, don't want to believe me. And they want my father cast as the icon. They want him to be this terrible person that can be warned against. There one goes unsullied as yet in his Pullman pride, toying, oh boy, with a blunderbuss bourbon, being smoked by a large cigar, riding out to the wide open spaces of the faces of his waiting boy. When that light came up on him, all the lights came on, and it was the most beautiful, inspiring, fantastic performance. The Welsh quality, uh, the voice was, was just very special, the golden voice. As a sculptor, I felt that he was doing things with words that I hadn't found in other poetry. We weren't used to that kind of thing. You never get that ass licking in England and so on. He adored it, he loved it. I don't blame him. I was probably very envious and resentful. Dylan, will you read me some poetry tonight before you and Kathleen go home? Pleasure. I'll read a poem of my own and then one or two poems by other people. In the mustard seed sun, by full tilt river and switchback sea where the cormorant scud, in his house on stilts high among beaks and palavers of birds. This sand grain day in the bent bay's grave, he celebrates and spurns his driftwood 35th wind turned age. Heron, spire, and spear. I couldn't regret marrying Dylan, was it? An experience in a lifetime, and, and he was a marvelous person. Let's, let's face it, it's just that I didn't want to share him with anybody. But you can't expect of me to have someone who's made for everybody, all for myself. 
Dylan made the second of his four trips to America, the one that immediately preceded the Undermilk Wood journey, in 1952. They arrived on January the 20th and stayed for four months. In the first leg of the tour, he did 26 performances in 47 days. Grueling. But the most important thing about the trip is that it was the only one he took with Catlin. People are still taking sides in this marriage. What tends to get forgotten is that these two people could not leave each other alone. They were in love. Catelyn survived him by more than 40 years and left no less than three accounts of the relationship after Dylan was dead. But though she could be seen as both progenitor and participant in the Dylan Thomas myth, the fact is that she was genuinely concerned for him. And she paid him the supreme compliment that, unlike the campus groupies, she never made the mistake of taking him too seriously. There's a wonderful story of a posh dinner party in Carmel in California. As people are clearing their throats, ready for Dylan to start singing for his supper, Kathleen growls, and now I suppose we'll have some poetry. The public theatricality of their rows was actually designed to keep people out. How did he write poetry? Was it easy for him or difficult? No, no, no. It was terribly difficult. He, was, uh, he used to go into his little shed and uh, scrape and scratch and mutter and mumble and uh, intone and, and change. And he was frightfully slow, you know. In one whole up, long afternoon from about two to seven, he might have done just one line or taken out one word or put in one word. When at readings he introduced his beautiful lyric poem, In My Craft or Sullen Art, Exercised in the Still Night, he used to say, this poem's a complete fraud. Actually, I work in the afternoons like everyone else. And he did work. He wrote and rewrote, often using a thesaurus to find exactly the right synonyms. He's said to have produced up to 200 separate and distinct versions of the same poem. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. I never trusted him. No, I didn't, because he was a typical Welshman. And a thief and a liar. Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief. Most evenings after work, Dylan would return to the pub